Hey everyone, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Hagty. Today I'm joined by Odie from Limbic Labs. How are you doing today, Odie? Yeah, really good. Really good, Stephen. How are you? Good. Yeah, good, man. Thank you for joining me on this Saturday evening, even though no one's doing anything and we're all stuck at home anyway. But thank yeah, you anyway. Corona coronavirus has seen to that. And uh, massive thanks for inviting me onto your show as well. No, appreciate this. Um, so first first question, as always, talk to me about Limbic Labs, what you guys do, what you guys are about, who you help, and then we can get into how you got to where you are today. Sure. So Limbic Labs is a venture studio. Uh, we're headquartered in London, but we've been really remote uh, from the start. So our DNA is a distributed team. And we were set up just about two years ago now. Uh, with a focus on really just building and testing. The philosophy that, that fed into us even uh, getting started is just a recognition that most companies uh, that get founded today uh, often do so on, uh, there's often a trend of solution first and then go in search of a problem for it to fix. And we think that is obviously a fundamental uh, part of why companies often go broke and go bust. They don't find enough customers because they're not really uh, resonating uh, mm -hmm. with the customers. So Limbic Labs is uh, by design about iterating, uh, building and throwing ideas at the wall and actually iterating on them as rapidly and efficiently as possible uh, in order to uh, create solutions that actually have limbic resonance. So resonance with the limbic system of the uh, end user or buyer of that product, uh, hence the name. So we're about uh, we're about building, we're about testing, we're about throwing new new ideas out there, no matter how crazy. And uh, and the founder, uh, I I started it coming out of a previous startup called Vuzi, and uh, I'd run that one for a number of years. Uh, we exited, and I realized that some of the many mistakes we'd made at Vuzi could have been better avoided if we'd had a more methodical approach to actually getting started. Um, mm. So that's really us. That's Limbic Labs. Love it. Love that little blurb. Perfectly described. For you, after you exited your previous company, what was the gap between exiting, probably like thinking, oh my God, I've done, I've done the founder entrepreneur thing. Like I've checked that box to now then going, oh, now I want a new, I want a new thing. I want a new focus. Well, I realized, um, you know, whilst running the company that I was, uh, once you start down that road, there's no real going back. You know, you, you can't unsee what you've seen. You can't unknow what you now know. Um, and if you mean the amount of time between, you know, the exit and starting Limbic Labs, I think uh, it was around Valentine's Day, actually, uh, 2018, uh, when we sold. Uh, but it wasn't long after that, to be honest. Uh, this was around about the time there was so much going on. Um, I took maybe a week off of not actually doing anything, but I was so excited by um, a lot of different uh, new technologies and uh, just a lot of new concepts I was focused on learning uh, that I just got straight into it. But I, I recognized that I didn't want to go into founding something. So conveniently limbic labs actually gave me an excuse to be as wrong as i needed to be to find what was actually right so it was it was essentially born out of an intentional uh desire not to have to get it right um but instead to let the data tell me what startup was the right one so it was, it's just it's a vehicle for experimentation uh for all of us how did it feel doing it in that different sort of mindset approach where if you got it wrong it doesn't matter it's amazing. It's literally completely liberating. Um, it frees you up from needing to be right. You know, what we need to be right about is our methodology. We need to be passionate about learning. We need to be passionate about getting it, uh, getting better at our process and, and how we actually build a startup. Um, and so we redesigned how we actually do the building in the first place. We don't need to be perfect with the idea itself. We don't need to be perfect with, with that. Um, and that, that has been a game changer, an absolute game changer. It's completely liberating. Uh, I wish I'd done this first time. Yeah, because that, that's going to be one of my next questions. It's, you know, you obviously learned a lot from your, your previous business. Did yeah. Was it hard to do things in that way of not caring? Or did you often feel yourself slipping back into the old ways and then having to, like, 
click yourself out of it a couple of times uh, you know you yeah definitely there have been a couple of times where you know you come up with an idea and you think oh this would be really cool you know what if i just go out and get this built and you think wait wait this is exactly you know <laughs> how we got here let's not just go out and build an idea because you think it's cool mm. um there seems yeah, to be a fine think, line though between that like shiny object and the not caring and testing i think the main thing is validate the shiny object uh, mm -hmm. that's really what it's about um i think we made so many mistakes when we were getting started you know with, with view z we we literally did almost everything it was actually impressive how many things we got wrong <laughs> and still like still stayed alive uh yeah we we now we now have uh you know a book on just better practices you know mm. i wouldn't say necessarily best practices there are always better and better ways but we just keep on compiling this library of mistakes that we previously made um, and then just recognize, okay, well, add that one to the list of things not to do, you know, next time. Yeah, so that's, that, that's one way we've been trying to get better at it. Good man. When you first started Limbic, was it just you or did you already go into it with a small team? How did you manage that? So with the, uh, with the journey we did with ViewZ, um, there were... There's some really, really good people around us that, um, that I knew I wanted to work with. You know, either they worked on, uh, you know, maybe smaller, shorter term projects here in Visi, or they didn't go along with the exit, as in they didn't stay long at the acquire. So it was actually from those, uh, that group that, you know, I pulled in some of the people that, you know, had the opportunity to work with before and knew that I wanted to work with again. Um, yeah, that was, that was really where I got the team from. And, you know, we've taken a different structure as well. Rather than being sort of very staff heavy from the start, I shouldn't be touching my face. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're inside. You're fine. COVID rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rather than being uh, very, uh, very uh, staff heavy from the start, um, you know, one of the things that we've, you know, that we did is actually structure ourselves in a much, much lighter fashion. There's a core team. And the core team, um, you know, it can flex in size, but you know, it's, it's anything from four to seven people at a time. Uh, and then there's a much larger extended bank of uh, uh, professionals who we will then call in, depending on the project that we're working on validating that at the time. And so that allows us to main, essentially stay lean uh, during periods of experimentation and validating things, and then to scale up quite quickly with folks that we vetted that we you know we all know and and, and like each other's work yeah um and that's how we structured it amazing Let, let's talk about the project side of things then how yep. what's your sort of filtration system to decide what's a good project what's a bad project to focus on so we've been quite methodical about how we actually create um create projects and, and ideas themselves uh we i mean okay it generally, the uh, best way to think about it is it always starts with the end customer. It always starts with who they are. Um, mm -hmm. always starts with our understanding of them. Uh, we've had to get very aware of our own circles of competence. Um, you know, the concept essentially being that when you start uh, off in, you know, when you start a professionally, you don't really have any circles of competence. But over the years, uh, you find what you're better at and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, and as you grow your expertise in those spaces, you just more, get more and more effective. Um, and the deeper you go, the, uh, the more original thought you're often capable of. So with us, as a team, identifying our circles of competence help us go faster to uh, knowing whether we personally actually uh, have enough uh, understanding of a problem. And it's not understanding of a solution, but it really comes down to understanding of a problem space you know do we do we have a good knowledge of the key areas of interest or concern for mm. a particular uh, ideal customer profile and if that customer is well understood then we're more likely to create something that resonates with him or her and yeah. so it's just it's been aware about that circle of competence the rest of it really comes down from there to okay well if we do understand who they are and we understand what they really do care about 
then can we build something that actually is better than what's the best in class in the market today? Mm. Um, and it's just been very methodical about starting off with the who rather than with the what. Yeah. Um, and then going through the processes of actually not just trusting that we've got it right, but validating it very rapidly, validating it very cost effectively. Amazing. Um, and then allowing the market and the data to override our egos. And if we loved an idea, if the data doesn't support it, that doesn't, you know, then the, the idea needs mm-hmm. to die. Yeah. Uh, and just being very uh, ego uh, free or light. Uh, Le- sure. Yeah, we, we, pride, we pride ourselves on, on learning rather mm-hmm. than on being right. Yeah, I think I think that's such a good point to bring up as well because there's a lot of um, founders out there that have a or, or believe they have a great idea because it solves a certain issue, but it only solves their issue. They haven't validated it with other customers or other clients. Why is it? Do you think people get get into that space? And that could be a really dangerous space that people spend a lot of time on, and not necessarily waste time, but they realise after the fact that or they could have changed things? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think we get our identities uh, caught up in you know what we push out there. We get our egos attached to what we tell the world that we're going to achieve and what we're going to do. And we make it about us. We don't make it about mm-hmm. the customer. We don't end- make it about the market. We fall in love with ideas. And these are all human uh, you know, very, very human mistakes to make. And these are also very, very common. I, I'm, I posit that over 80% of startups die because of exactly this mistake. Yeah. Um, and, and if uh, and if you look at it, it's actually the first mistake. Um, and it's actually the one that shows no feedback until a year or two into the journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, after you've taken investor money, after you've spent time, or after you've you know, uh, had people commit their careers to to, to working with you on, on this, that you eventually find out that it's wrong. So it's actually potentially the most dangerous mistake in the startup, uh, effectively the silent killer. Mm. Um, it's just human nature. Um, and it just takes slowing down, uh, zooming in and understanding the truth and understanding that actually it's not about you. It's, it's not about what you, the model, the mental model you have of reality. It's actually about what the truth really is. And if you, you know, if you refer to Ray Dalio's principles, one of the key, you know, elements that, you know, that Ray's work uh, points out is how important it is to lay, set aside um, anything uh, but the truth and just being honest with yourself about what what is real rather than what you want to be real. And I think that's how you can overcome that as a founder. Mm, love that. Have you always thought like that or have you developed that through certain means over the years? Like I said, I, I'm, I've made an impressive amount of mistakes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had we played trump cards. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. I, I could I could pull out some some real bangers. Uh, no, definitely didn't think that way. No, it's definitely had something that I've that I've had to make make the mistakes and just you know brush mm. myself up, uh, up, get up and learn and try again. Uh, just get uh, better and better. Uh, at making fewer of the same mistakes. And, you know, I'm still on that journey, of course. Um, but it, it's something that I've had to learn and, and through that's mostly through trial and error. Yeah. What's the difference between you and someone that's making those mistakes but not learning then? Feedback. Um, you know, I think the sooner you get feedback that what you're uh, doing doesn't work, you know, some of us will... Uh, say okay that didn't work and you know I'm going to try and find a different way and some mm-hmm. some people will you know get up and say this game isn't for me you know that was too painful an experience to be publicly humiliated if they start it doesn't work um, you know these are very public games we play to be uh, in a position where you take on a huge financial risk uh, if you have obligations in life you know these things are quite real um, and quite raw and, and yeah the feedback is the is the reason if you've had that feedback um, and you decide to persevere um, I think that's that's what I've had the opportunity to learn from and I think you know if you're maybe if you've either been fortunate to have gotten it right first time or perhaps you have you're not that 
uh, later, you're not that advanced into your journey or mm. in terms of time. Uh, you, uh, you haven't had reality give you the feedback yet. Yeah. There's, you'll get feedback one way or another. Basically. You'll definitely get feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's with yeah. the okay. So in the last couple of years since you started in that, with the feedback that you've got so far, what what are you doing with that, and where are you taking Limbic? Uh, hmm. The feedback that I've gotten so far, where I'm taking Limbic. Interesting question. Um, lots of lots of uh, pieces of feedback. Um, I mean, a lot of our methodology is built on this, so. Uh, one of the things that we uh, recognize very early on is how we actually work. Uh, we have been remote since we started. You know, we had uh, an amazing uh, CTO working with us, Jan. And, uh, you know, Jan was working uh, in a completely different country from the start. And we weren't sure whether this would work. You know, this is before remote working became, you know, on this 95 now. <laughs> And and we we you know as a startup we were very scrappy we we couldn't um, you know we couldn't uh, have everybody uh, on market level salaries so whilst the member while the whilst the team were taking the compromises you know, that you sometimes need to when you're an early stage startup we recognised that one of the edges that we had against let's say a bigger competitor who could you know could outpay for an amazing you know uh, member of the team like Jan. Uh, was actually the freedom that we could offer. You know, with us, uh, Jan was able to work from home if he wanted to. He could you know, go down to his home office uh, at the bottom of his garden and, you know, working from there, pop home uh, across the garden for lunch and get, get back to work. He had all his, his comforts and, and, and tools and, you know, freedom around him, and we gave him that trust. Um, and amazingly, you know, we had Facebook at the time, you know, trying to, you know, poach him away because you know, he really was that great but he stayed um, oh. and you know I don't think he was always you know partly you know loyalty to the project and the team but you know in part of it we also believe was uh, recognition that as long as a person produces uh, the right outputs it doesn't really matter what the inputs look like so showing up at 8 or 8.30 or 9 doesn't really have an impact necessarily mm. on what the person is you know, producing through the day uh, and recognizing, uh, you know, recognizing that uh, gave us the, you know, gave us the confidence to say, you know what, actually anyone can now work from you know, wherever you need to. That was just one example of the types of things that we learned. There were several others. I mean, I could, I could, I could talk uh, for hours <laughs> about the different lessons that we've learned about the different, um, you know, uh, insights that, that, and pieces of feedback that we stacked on top of one another. Yeah, um, but remote working gave us a massive edge. We were able to, you know, hire really good people that that you know, if they lived in a world centre like London or New York, uh, would have had much higher living expenses. Sure. And, you know, we maybe wouldn't have been able to have, have picked up as an early stage company. Um, yeah, it still amazes me how many businesses don't think remote working can work for them. Sorry, say that one more time. There's an audio problem. I think. I just said uh, it still amazes me how many companies still think remote working can't work for them. Yeah, yeah, and now they're now they're having to find out. Um, yeah, and it's find, gonna... but it really works for everybody, actually. Exactly, and I think after this whole thing happens, you know, moves on past, it's going to be a lot harder for companies to say you can't work from home, and yeah. it's going to show a lot of employees actually what they value. Um, you know, things like Jan yeah. being able to pop and have lunch with his family, small yeah. details like that make a huge difference yeah. um, when people are used to doing that nine to five, the two hours on the tube, whatever it is. No, completely. Like, I, I think showing people uh, that this actually works, is, a lot of it is about overcoming fear. You know, there's the fear yeah. that you know, maybe, you know, folks aren't, aren't being as productive. Um, if your back is turned, then you're not able to look over their shoulders, you know, as a founder um, or as, you know, as a leader of people. But do you also realize that that's a really inefficient and ineffective way to, to yeah. lead and manage yourself? Um, you know, you really need to be a lot more um, trusting and pick the right people mm. and give them the freedom to, to work as they need to and get what they need to done. 
it's also exhausting just checking in on everyone all the time just have the trust yeah <laughs> you know. yeah you you have to have trust you know to have a if you have a culture you know where you're needing to check in on people all the time that's generally not going to be very healthy and yeah and probably quite toxic 100 percent. so next question on that on the back of that question is where are you taking limbic what's happening what's your next stages of growth right so there's a project we're working on right now i'm quite excited about um and it's called orangutan so we've come out this through recognizing again um, you know which uh, customers we uh, best understand and uh, orangutan's really designed to help sales teams better connect and brands as well better connect with customers so what we're essentially doing is we're applying uh, essentially okay better way to explain this um as the visitor comes to a website and uh, engages with the website reads materials clips around um, at some point uh, they may show an expression of interest they may fill in a form um, and uh, at that point they may decide to leave after filling out the form you know we often do it at the end of a customer journey uh, we find that there's a there's a massive drop off between those who express interest through a form uh, they've submitted and the eventual conversations they may have uh, with let's say a sales rep Mm -hmm. um, and that costs companies a lot of money. So Orangutan is actually a tool to allow uh, those teams who are investing in getting people to their websites to have a video call the moment a person submits a form uh, and actually talk to a, talk to the, a, the interested customer much earlier than Ooh. they would have otherwise. So give them the opportunity to have that call. Um, and we're like uh, looking at this as a way of, sorry? I said, I like that. I like that idea. Yeah, we're looking at this as a way of, of, of just providing a much more streamlined experience mm -hmm. uh, of connecting with potential customers. And a second you know, key benefit from this is actually allowing brands to live stream uh, their authentic selves across their owned media. So across their websites and, and, and the other media they own uh, so that they are obviously better known, better liked and better trusted mm. uh, by those that are, you know, that are on those sites. Um, and again, this is about allowing the authenticity of a brand to shine through. Um, and obviously, you know, that, that is better for the customers to know who they're dealing with. Uh, that's better for the brands to be better known themselves in the first place. So that's really what Orangutan is. Um, check it out. It's orangutan.io. Love it. I will. I definitely will. I'll, I'll tell everyone and I'll put it in my group as well, because I'm sure there's so many people that will jump on that and uh, really explore that. Um, so only exactly so my one of my final questions to you is and i think we're going to give this as a gem but there's one i ask everyone you know if you could give three pieces of advice to another founder uh maybe to help them get that feedback in the best way possible because that's so crucial what are what are the best ways to do that in your opinion three facts three things three things uh the first one would be to slow down you know i was in uh, personally i was in such a race uh, to get it done, to you know, to reach those goals, to 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 just to to be where I thought I needed mm. to get to, and that was such a mistake. You know, I missed so many signposts along the way that I was going the wrong direction, uh, but I was you know, flooring it. I just didn't have time to steer the metaphorical car. Uh, so the first thing I would say is to actually slow down. You actually get there faster um, if you slow down, which is you know strange, but it actually works. <laughs> Uh, the second is to become a voracious learner. Learn everything you can. Uh, you know, absorb as many, uh, as much information as you can from trusted sources. You know that will teach you. You know, just dive deep. Go beyond the you know the tech press media. You know, yeah. you're not necessarily going to learn what you need to on TechCrunch. You know, like, like as interesting as it is, uh, but just focus on being a voracious learner. Um, I think the third thing is, you know, success isn't necessarily about the end number, but it's often about um, the process and how you do what you do and be obsessed with doing things more, eff more effectively and better. Uh, be obsessed with uh, improving your how and you'll often find that you get to the end result anyway, just, you know, more effectively. Yeah, love it. I knew you would have three gems. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. I hope those are helpful. No, no, super helpful. And uh, I know I already have people in mind that those 
immediately will help so that's really good so only my uh my final final question to you is if anyone wants to get in touch with you learn more about limbic uh and just learn more about what you guys do what's the best way for them to do that uh i'm you can easily reach me on twitter so i'm at odera u on twitter o-d-e-r-a-u uh i'm also uh, if you go to the limit clubs if you go to orangutan.io uh you will be able to find us there as well obviously so orangutan spent the usual way uh dot io perfect thank you so much for coming on founder 365 i've thoroughly enjoyed it and i am super looking forward to just seeing how you guys develop this year next year and see what you guys get up to i no doubt you will be coming out with some amazing things thanks and thanks for inviting me on to this show uh Stephen. i'm looking forward to uh yeah to watching it back myself <laughs> perfect <laughs> thanks everyone for watching and listening this has been founders 365 with me Stephen haggerty